thanks everybody for coming. Um, my name is Rand Graham. I'm one of the co-organizers. I think I've met most of you. Um, and tonight I'm going to give a talk about how to record a technical talk on a budget. And as Steve already mentioned, it's pretty meta because I am recording this talk right now. So let's get started. The first thing I'd like to address is why. Why record the talk at all? And to me, the most important reason is because when someone's preparing a talk, they put a lot of effort into putting the talk together. And so when people do a lot of work to do something, they like to have a record of it. So, you know, one of the examples that I've been watching lately is people take their GoPro out into the wilderness and then they record the video of their wilderness trip and put it on YouTube because they went through all that effort to get out there and they want to make a record of it. And so then, of course, then we want to share it with the world and when we're recording our technical talk, <clears throat> clearly this is going to create a record of something we did in, in a somewhat professional context. And so people will be able to find you online. They'll be able to Google your name and find a talk that you did because we're going to put it on our YouTube channel. And also as an organ co-organizer of a meetup, I've used this in the past to recruit people to come talk at our meetup. And so I've invited speakers to come because I've seen them on YouTube and said, okay, not only do I have a warm fuzzy that they spoke at a different meetup, but they also, I can tell they're doing a great job just by watching five minutes of their, their video. And then one thing I include, because it's probably of the three, the least important is that somebody, for whatever reason, couldn't physically be here. They can see what they missed. I'm not sure how often that actually happens, but there is a record. If there's something they really wanted to see, they can come and, and watch watch the video. Okay, so let's get into the style of the video now. We could, <clears throat> we could just record an audio track and someone talking over their slides. But what we have here, it's not showing too well tonight on the projector, is I have a, like a picture-in-picture -picture effect where we have a speaker, in this case in the upper left corner of the video. So. Now we can see, hey, it's an actual live human being. He's in front of people, he's moving around, and he's giving his talk. But we use the picture in picture effect, and we shrink him down because it is a technical talk, so we want to focus on the technical content. So we record the slides. And what we can do, because we're on a budget, now if we had unlimited budget, we could hire a third party company, they'd come in with professional equipment and they'd make a recording for us. We see this in some of the big conferences. You know, weeks, a couple weeks go by and all the talks are professionally recorded, multiple cameras, great sound, good lighting, and it's all, and it's professionally edited. But what we can do with our consumer grade equipment, we can, today, we can easily record 1080p video X264 video codec and AAC audio. This is ideal for YouTube. It also works well in the, in the post-processing and editing. There are 4K cameras that exist. There's software that will edit 4K video. But I think at this point, it's a little bit overkill <laughs> for just a technical talk. So at this point, I want to give a shout out to Northwest Chicago JavaScript because I was looking for meetups close to my home. I came across this one, I'm like, I should go there. Then I found their YouTube channel. I'm like, I like the format of their videos. And so if you notice, the Northwest Chicago JavaScript YouTube channel uses a very similar format because I copied their format. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Madalone is the organizer and he's in charge of recording their technical talks. And what they end up with is a screen recording in 1080p, and then the speaker and one of the quadrants talking. I, and I, so I went to his meetup, I talked to him about how he did it. Which leads to the equipment list. And this is all consumer grade stuff. 
Of course, you're going to need a camcorder. And the biggest audio tip, if you start reading about recording, how to make your recording better, the biggest audio tip is don't use the included microphone that comes with your camcorder. There are many reasons for this. But one of the things you'll find is that the sky is the limit on professional microphones. The professionals use shotgun microphones that start at about $1,000. You could, I could spend on a, what, 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 what would be considered maybe a prosumer level road shotgun microphone designed to go on a DSL, DSLR camera, that would cost more than my camcorder. I got my camcorder, again, because we're on a budget. I had my equipment list. I bought all this on Black Friday. And so I saved at least 30%. But I could spend more on a microphone than I, I did on the camcorder. The, the, the road microphone started about 200 whereas my camcorder I got for 169 Okay. But the other key factor that enables this is this screen recorder. And there exists a population of people that are interested in recording their screen at a high resolution and streaming it over the internet. They're called gamers. <laughs> and this population of people is large enough that there's hardware vendors out there to support them. And the screen re recorder that we use is an Avermedia portable screen recorder. And what it allows you to do is take an HDMI input and record the screen 1080p, 60 frames a second, directly to an SD, a micro SD card. So that's how we get our, our, our nice screen capture. And again, those of you who got here early, we're in on the discussion of the HDMI splitter. There's a popular brand of laptops from a company that likes to make their own hardware standards and is, let's say, gets along very well with Hollywood and is able to negotiate deals with Hollywood that other companies just aren't able to negotiate. But one of the things that happens is their laptop, by default, enables copy protection over HDMI. And so in this setup, I'm using a low-cost, made-in-China HDMI splitter that comes out of the laptop and feeds video into the screen recorder. And I'm not actually splitting the HDMI signal. The only reason I'm using this is because the side effect of this low-cost device is that it strips the copy production. <laughs> I'm able to record this proprietary laptop directly to disk. Then you're going to need very, you know, sorry, associated SD cards, HDMI cables, USB cables, a power strip, a bag. Tonight I learned it would be a good idea to have the generic three-prong power cable as well in this bag. <laughs> the bag I chose is a musician's gig bag, and I actually chose it because it's known to be heavy duty, and I knew it was large enough, had a pocket large enough that it was going to hold my tripod when it's folded up. So that's how I chose the bag. Can you speak just a little bit more to the microphone? You thought about oh, right, real, real cheap. But what microphone did you end up selecting? So this microphone, again, Joe Malone sent me an email with links to the websites and exactly what equipment he used. Of course, time marches on. I had a, the next generation camcorder, but the, the microphone I got is twenty nine ninety nine, and it it comes from Walmart. And the thing is so cheap, it has an LED on it. The LED has never worked. <laughs> <laughs> but I also take it on faith that the sound quality is better than the built-in microphone. And the, another problem with my consumer-grade equipment and my consumer-grade microphone, it has a 3.5 millimeter audio input jack, which is very consumer-based. The standard, um, it, it's not what a pro audio mic jack we use they use xlr cables which are better in many ways and it, some engineering behind them but we can get we can get we can use the 80 20 rule we can spend 30 bucks and we can get good enough audio and i'm also going to get into how we try to fix some problems in the post processing to make sure what we want is the audio to be good enough so that people can focus on the content that they're not distracted by poor audio that's the goal. And I use a $30 microphone from Walmart, and I could send you the link if you are interested in it. The reason I was raising my hand is that I, I did have serious recorded 
couple hundred interviews uh, with people at conferences, and I picked up a H2 brand. Um, it's one of those dual, are they dual, uh, uh, what are they, dual barrel, whatever. It's got two cross crossing uh, um, microphone receivers. And what saved me, though, is that it recorded to SD card as well as to the line out. Amazing audio. I mean, just for 200 it was $200, but it was amazing audio. But having that simultaneous recording to the SD card when I had a battery failure in the middle of, of recording, um, say, my, well, I should say a laptop glitched out while I was doing, uh, while I was recording to the laptop. But having that backup audio going into the SD card enabled me to have a, a raw audio redundancy. Uh, so this it's one thing that's like with those microphones, because if you're doing a, a talk or an interview or something, you only have one shot at doing that, having redundant right. Yes, I agree. So the other top tip that they'll give you is that you should be monitoring your audio as you record. Like that's what a professional would do. They wouldn't record audio without listening, having a headset and saying, I know I'm getting an audio track. But having redundancy is good. The re so the reason I don't use a, a separate field recorder, the other reason I like this is my audio is fed directly into my video recorder. So now I'm recording digital audio and digital video, and I know that audio track is synced to the video. And so I, I like this microphone because I know I'm going to get good audio sync. It, it makes sense, and it would be a good idea to have a backup it, that would uh, require more work in post-processing in order to take that separate audio track and sync it back to the video. Um, but it does make sense to at least have a backup, even if I was going to use that as a primary. Yeah, no, I it, was, it was going into the video. But the, this, this gaming recorder does have a... It's designed to use a gaming headset, which is, again, there's, there's a 4-pin 3.5-millimeter connection. Sometimes it's called TRRS. But some vendors have diff the audio on different rings of that four pin connector. And it, basically what I've found in reading about it is it comes down to the difference between Android and iOS. One vendor likes to do it one way and the other vendor likes to do it the other way. But I can get a microphone and have a backup copy on my screen recorder. I've experimented with that, I've never done it at a presentation. But it does make sense to at least have a backup so that even if it was more work, you could go back and post-process it and sync that audio. And that's another thing, like if you have you ever seen videos where they have the clapper and they do that clap. They're doing that specifically, and if you start post editing video, you know why exactly why they do that. Professionals are gonna have a, they're going to have a separate audio track, and they're gonna stand in front of the camera and gonna make a, a large clapping sound, which is gonna saturate your audio. And it's gonna create a spike in your audio waveform. So when you go back and post, now it's become very easy. And there's even some software that can automatically sync that audio track to the video track. And again, on a budget, you could just clap your hands in front of the camera, and that would create this audio spike, and you could go back and sync it that way. I haven't, I haven't actually tried that. So you have to write the program number in the frame. <laughs> on your right. You get the cool little stripes on it and everything. We could make one. That'd be kind so of fun. So just to emphasize something, because I've worked with Grant on some of this. Um, this screen recorder has an SD card in it that's recording the screen as, as we're going in. I'm sure you're going to do that when you go to the processing. But. Right. Yeah. So you're going to need a SD card for your digital camcorder, and you're going to need a micro SD card for this, and you're going to want a fast one. Um, but nowadays, I guess it's called class one. They're all fast enough now. Well, there's class, they have a class, and then there's another called the U. It's the U symbol. So class 10 and U1 is the same speed. But yes, if and you they got U1, U2, U3, I don't know what they got. And, and if you walk into Best Buy tomorrow, which I've done. Which is not a good place to buy that stuff. No, one brand will be marked down 40% off. Like, it varies which brand is. It might be Sandus one week, Lexar the next week. But one brand will be on sale, and you can get what you need at Best Buy. Well, and the other thing oh, with the, that point. microphone that you're showing is that it's um, directional. Uh, one thing I learned the hard way is 
making sure not to have an omnidirectional microphone because you will pick up everything. But when you have that right. directional microphone, it's, it's going to be. Right, and again, that's why the pros use a shotgun microphone. A shotgun microphone is, has a very directional pattern. So then it's 2018, and there's a Japanese company that makes camcorders, and guess what? They have a file size limit. The file size limit is 32-bit int. Because who needs a file bigger than 32-bit int, right? So what you end up with is something on your file system like this. You end up with clip one, clip two, clip three, and so on and so on. And if someone gives a two-hour presentation, which is generally about the limit of what we've seen in our meetup, you know, you, and there's intermission in the middle, you'll end up with six clips. And so if you're looking at this, you're thinking, I need a shell script to process all that. <laughs> <laughs> so now let's get, let's get to that moving the picture-in-picture -picture effect and moving the speaker to the upper left corner. So we need to do something called an affine transformation or sometimes called downsampling. We basically need to reduce the resolution of the speaker because it's only going to take up one-eighth of the screen. And what I have here is a bash script that will use GStreamer and it will use Intel hardware accelerated GStreamer plugins to downsample the video and this can operate at about 10 times real time so that my 4.2 gigabyte file size is about 23 minutes of video and it comes in to downsample it, I can downsample it in about a minute and 43 seconds. I can throw it in a shell script, I can get coffee in. Now I have all my clips arranged so my speaker will be downsampled. Use, because CPUs these days come with X264 hardware. There's actual, it's not graphics hardware, it's not general, perfect, general purpose graphics hardware, it's an actual H264 encoder that comes on your Intel CPU. The other thing I do is, again, use FFmpeg and I'm going to strip the audio. Again, I'm going to use a shell script. And there's a reason I'm going to strip the audio. Because there's something called loudness normalization. And the thing is, when you're listening to digital video and audio, either through your phone or on your computer, like through YouTube, what you don't want is that late night commercial effect. You don't want someone coming on and being so loud, okay? But, and then if you have a series of videos, you don't want one video to be normalized to a certain decibel level, and then the guy goes to the next video and it's 5 dB higher. So you want to normalize your audio on the same video as well as across videos. So. There's been PhD research on how to properly loudness normalize the human voice because some, some people might have a, um, a music track at the beginning. You don't want to run your algorithm and treat the music the same way. There's, there is an FFmpeg implementation of the audio normalization, but some of the PhD researchers <clears throat> have, have done all this They'll even reduce a background hum so that if you have a, a motor in the background, they can take uh, a, a background hum out of the audio automatically. They can clean up your audio and normalize it. And this software is marketed towards podcasters. Podcasters tend to have dual tracks. There used to be something called Levelator. So if you're recording a phone call on one track and the other end of the phone call on another track, he, he's holding the microphone 12 inches away from his mouth, and your microphone's three inches, and you have this microphone technique difference, so one track is louder than the other, you need to normalize that so that both people are talking at the same level. And when you care about this, you're gonna, and you notice it, you're gonna fix it in post. And, but what we have here, because we're on a budget, is all phonic is a software as a service that will do all those audio algorithms, they'll do the loudness normalization and the leveling, and they will ignore your music track, and they will give you two hours on their cloud server, 
Remember, there's no cloud, it's just somebody else's computer. They give you two hours of audio processing, which happens to be just enough for our typical meetups. And so I run, I strip all that audio and I run it through Authonic, upload it to a website and download it back, and it's all normalized for me. And, they, and I'm trusting them, and they do a good job, of cleaning up the audio. So then, we have all our files and all our clips, and this isn't the best lighting. But again, because we're on a budget, there's a company called DaVinci Resolve. They make a lot of high-end video cameras, video recorders. And what they offer is they offer a free version of their software. So what you need to put it all together is non-linear video editing software. You can put um, that music track at the beginning. You can stitch all those video files together. And you can put the speaker in the upper left corner. And you can put nice transitions between um, certain clips if that's what you want to do. But again, because we're operating at 1080p and we're not operating at 4K, I think once you start doing some of these techniques at 4K, you start having to pay for DaVinci Resolve. But for our purposes, we can use the freely available version of DaVinci Resolve to edit our video. I try to use nonlinear video editor on Linux, and for my purposes, when I had more than one four gigabyte file in the Linux video editors, I couldn't get anything that was worked reasonably well, and I landed on DaVinci Resolve, which I run under Windows. People that have that proprietary laptop, they can also get DaVinci Resolve, as well as many other video editing software solutions. I wanted to show a close-up of the timeline in DaVinci Resolve, because what this is showing is, I have multiple tracks here. I have, this is the audio track, this is my screen recorder, and then I have layers. So that at the beginning of a video, before, while that um, title screen is on, I can show full length, you know, a minute or two, I can show full video 1080p of the speaker, and then as soon as they hit that first button and they go to their first slide, then I can move to my um, smaller clips where now I move the speaker up into the upper left corner. And to get all that done, you need that nonlinear video editing software, which I use DaVinci, the free version of DaVinci Resolve. And then the other thing I wanted to show was how we get this speaker, in this case, he's in the upper right. And there's something called a transform. Again, I've, I've downsampled that. The, the DaVinci Resolve will downsample it and move the video to the upper right corner. It'll do it all in one step. But I've, I've unloaded some of the processing because my video editing computer is a two-year-old laptop with a Core M processor with onboard Intel graphics. DaVinci Resolve will support CUDA acceleration. So if you had a nice desktop, with a nice NVIDIA graphics card, you're gonna get a lot better performance. So for me, on my laptop, I kick it off overnight, and for a two hour video, sometimes it takes 12 hours to what's called render the video. And that's where it combines all the tracks into one video image and, and outputs the audio with the codecs you choose. That's all I had, and we've, we've had some questions as we went along, any more questions? Um, you have that splitter and that external screen recorder. What's the order, the connection sequence? So what you want to do is you go HDMI out of the laptop into the splitter and then out of the splitter into the screen recorder. And then this, the um, screen recorder has an HDMI output too so that if you're projector had an HDMI input, you would want to feed the HDMI output of the screen recorder into your projector. If yeah. you had a uh, if you had a Windows or Linux laptop, you could just delete the splitter and you would run HDMI out into the recorder and then the out of the recorder into the projector. 
And does the rec the external recorder, if there's audio in the HDMI channel, is it record? But if the laptop is generating audio, does it record that too? I don't think so. The screen recorder has an input jack for a gaming headset, and the audio that would be, would be recorded would be the audio uh, from the headset. And I'm not sure if you can so get them. I'm not sure if you can get both audio at the same time. No. So I, I haven't. Game was making noise that wouldn't get recorded. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. When we start recording our game and presentations, we'll be able to. Say the other thing to watch out for is if you're recording online, like I, I was doing some interviews via Skype. I was interviewing. I mean, I'm trying to. I was I was interviewing people via Skype, and then I was having the uh, software write out uh, the video file and then two separate audio tracks. What I wasn't paying attention to is they were using variable bitrate for the the actual um, codec and trying to sync that back up. I just gave up. I just I just I'm not doing this anymore. This is awful. Uh, so watching to make sure that everything is using the same same timings because when it tries to do that automated processing to overlay them, you'll always end up with this little bit off and you get that kind of that um, old Chinese movie effect, you know, <laughs> it's, which is not fun to watch. Yeah, so the, the audio drift and audio sync, again, that's why I use that microphone that just plugs into the camcorder. Well, you know, these are online. Remote. And again, when you're trying to do it on a budget, you come up with certain solutions. But I, <clears throat> when I was researching audio, I was listening to podcasters talk about how to improve their podcast audio because podcasters is a population of people that really cares about their audio quality. And what a professional does that's trying to make money from this podcast, they'll actually use uh, microphone preamps. And every, even if it's a Skype call, the guy would describe a scenario where he had one Macintosh computer for each Skype connection and the line out of his Mac was going into his microphone preamp, which was going into a soundboard, which was then getting recorded. Because that's kind of an expensive setup to have one computer for every Skype call and to have a soundboard and have a microphone preamp. It starts to add up. But he was on a podcast network and he really cared. And he wasn't leaving it to chance. He was using professional grade audio equipment to make sure he got the audio. And Having the Skype recording would be the backup worst case scenario where you'd have to ask somebody for a Skype recording because for some reason his other setup failed. But you can spend lots of money getting really good audio if you want.